Let me start by saying a big thank you to the organizers. It's an honor to be here. Lovely place and lovely company. Very good people here. Uh, <coughs> today, I, I've been given the task to give uh, an overview of a European project. Uh, it started two years ago, uh, supported by 10 million from the European Commission. It will unfortunately end in August 2020. So if you have any ideas to keep it moving, please do let me know. Uh, it brings together 23 partners, and Adrian and myself have the honor of uh, uh, coordinating this consortium. So let's see if I manage to give uh, justice to all the people that, that are doing the work. And what I try to do today is to highlight uh, the parallels between this project over here and the DCO. And echoing one of my uh, former speakers, I can probably say that uh, this project would not exist if DCO had not supported us. So what we did, <coughs> what we learned today, is that it's important to have access to field sites. So at, at the core of this S4C consortium, we do have a large number of sites across Europe. Uh, they are summarized in this uh, cartoon over here. You can see that they're very diverse. Perhaps for this community, that one that is a little bit outside the scope is this one here. It's an hydrocarbon processing plant uh, located in Italy. So we are looking at outside of the surface. All the other sites are under the surface. And what you can see is that they are quite diverse. We look at carbon sequestration. Uh, we are looking at production of shale gas. And we are also looking at the geothermal energy production. They are also very diverse in, in terms of their uh, lifetime, if you wish. There is one over there in Cornwall that is being uh, activated as we speak. I will give you some more details about that site in a few minutes. There is another site in Switzerland over there, the St. Gallen one, which is not active anymore. It is uh, kept there to study, but it is not producing anything. Uh, the sites in Iceland are currently being very productive. So basically, we are looking at the entire lifetime of sites, uh, including uh, scientific sites that are there to figure out the properties of the rocks. The, <clears throat> so that's where we start from. From the point of view of S4C, all of these sites are uh, resources that could be uh, beneficial for the community. They can produce energy, they can help us store CO2 in the long term. But of course, what we do need to recognize is that as any other activity that is related with the humans, there are a number of risks. So in this slide over here, I am listing some of the risks that are possible when we do operation in the subsurface. And these are the risks that uh, the S4C consortium is focusing on. Different communities uh, will pay more attention to some of these risks and less at attention to others. But as a, a research and uh, uh, engineering and scientific community, uh, including the industry, uh, what we need to be careful is that we need to be able to quantify uh, as, as well as we can the possibilities of all of these risks. We need to be able to come up with ways to reduce these risks. And if necessary, we need to come up with ways to mitigate the consequences of these risks. This is essential if we want to make this operation sustainable, and which will allow us to get a social license to operate in the various communities. So at the, the philosophy of the S4C consortium is that we can use fundamental science to reduce the risks. So in this slide over here, I'm essentially summarizing what is the, the, the philosophy of our consortium. We want to understand the asset using as much fundamental science as we can. Using that understanding, we, we want to come up with new technologies that could help us monitor, mitigate the various risks. And then using the combination of the new technology and the understanding, we want to make sure that uh, we reduce the risks for the uh, populations. This can be the summary of the entire project. So I could stop here, but in order to give a little bit of a, a <coughs> recognition to the people who are doing the various activities, I want to take you on one of the examples, picking one of the sites that we are uh, using in our consortium. So for that site, I picked uh, the one in Cornwall. This is a summary of that site. It's a deep geothermal site. Uh, during the, pro the, the project of S4C, both of these wells have been drilled. Uh, at the moment, the deepest one is a little bit over uh, five kilometers in depth. In the UK, this is the uh, deepest uh, onshore well that is available at the moment. The idea behind the operation is that there is an existing uh, fault, and the, our colleagues in Cornwall want to use that fault to uh, 
uh, enhance the transport of the water so that they can produce electricity on the surface. As I mentioned at the moment, both of these wells have been drilled. Uh, the stimulation of the fault will happen in the next few months. And during that stimulation, the idea is to use those seismic arrays to monitor the seismic response so that they can build up a better understanding of the subsurface. Having access to a site is essential if we want to make a new science. So again, inspired by the DCO, I've put there some reminders of where we find our inspirations for the quantities and the origins. What we can do is a multidisciplinary science to better understand what happens on the subsurface. So within the consortium, we are uh, developing new instruments to, to measure the, quant the mechanical properties of the rocks. Uh, we are using, for example, uh, CD X-ray scans to figure out the porosity of the various rocks. We are measuring permeabilities. We are also implementing uh, geochemistry analysis to figure out how the properties of the rocks change as we expose them to different chemicals, for example. And I saw some images of drones, so we cannot do less. So we also have drones to figure out what happens on, on, the, on the surface in these operations. The next slide is a little bit more of um, the understanding of what happens between the fluids and the rocks. And uh, this activity is uh, strongly connected with the deep energy. And here I must thank Dave Cole for his uh, support over the years. Dave has been a friend of mine over the past 15 years and we've done a lot of work together. So thank you, Dave, for your patience with us. And I'll walk with you a little bit about the activities that we do here. So we start from modeling uh, at the single pore level, the behavior of the fluids inside of the various pores. This is molecular dynamics understanding. And uh, it tells us how the structures and the properties of the fluids change when they are confined. Over the years, we have learned to do uh, non-equilibrium molecular dynamics, which allows us to study how different fluids move inside of the rocks at the single pore level. But now we are able to look at what happens with the, whether there are organics and non-organic components all at the same time. However, the simulations are done in a very single pore, so we need to scale up. For that, we are doing uh, computational fluid dynamics that allows us, backed up by those atomistic simulations, to predict the permeabilities of larger rocks. And we seem to have very good results that now are finally matching with experimental observations. And now what we are doing is to start uh, looking at how particles move inside of the rocks. And these are the results that are just coming out. And at every single one of these levels, we are trying to match against experiments that we pick uh, to validate our, our, our results. Now, another <coughs> link with the, the DCO is represented over here with the deep life. So this is work that is done by Isabel and uh, Benedict, for example. And the instrument that is highlighted over there is the PUSH-50 that has been developed in collaboration with the DCO. So our colleagues go in the various sites and they extract fluids from the various field sites. Then they can study the formation of uh, biominerals in the various rock samples. They can try uh, to isolate the various microorganisms using DNA. And uh, certainly they're trying to figure out what is the uh, biological pathways for those microbes. So these are the various uh, essential fundamental activities that we are doing. But the European Commission wants us to come back with the best practice recommendations, how to actually operate to minimize the environmental impact. So what we decided to do was to combine the various analyses into some sort of uh, summary. And one of the various activities that we do is to calculate life cycle assessments, for example. So in this cartoon here, I show you some of the results. So these are all possible environmental impacts that are connected with the pro production of one kilowatt hour of electricity. The bars in red represents the impact that is expected from the productivity of pro production of that amount of electricity in Cornwall on the side that I showed you at the beginning. And what you see is that there is a little bit of uncertainty over there because that site is not in operation yet. And what you see is that <clears throat> for every type of environmental impact, CO2 emissions, uh, photochemical ozone, ozone deformation, formation, we can compare that expected impact against that that is uh, known or estimated for other forms of energy. So for example, here we got uh, natural gas, nuclear energy, solar energy, and wind. And the idea is to provide the European Commission with tables like this so that they can make a, a informed decision on how to optimize the energy uh, input in, the, in Europe or in other parts of the world. 
So my time is about to, to come up. So the last slide that I want to show you here is a little bit of a summary of the legacy that our consortium is trying to give for the follow-up activities. And again, we take inspiration from the DCO. So we have learned today the importance of training the next generation. So all of that has to do with training. We start from be before university. We do outreach activities. During the university, we have started with the master's program. Uh, we also have training for PhDs, of course, and uh, uh, early career researchers. And also we have uh, activities that uh, do dissemination to the, to the wide public. And the DCO has been instrumental to provide support for those activities. We do have international collaborations, of course. The DCO is one of them. Craig is part of the advisory board. So thank you very much, Craig, for your support over the years. Uh, we try to provide uh, data for the follow-up research. So we have repositories of rock as well as data. And uh, we are also uh, developing a number of uh, technologies that we think could be commercial at some point. So Mirico, for example, Damien I see is in the audience over here, is developing a technique to measure gaseous emissions. Uh, SCM is a, a computing company, is developing a software that is looking at uh, uh, reactive molecular dynamics, and that software should become available very soon. TWI is coming up with a te technology to monitor the uh, stability of pipes over the years. And Helixa is a small company that is coming out from Switzerland that is developing uh, uh, tracers that are based on DNA, which may become helpful for some of the te technologies that you guys are interested in. With this, I stop. If there is time for any question, I'll be happy to answer. So thank you very much. Are there any questions? You got me excited there for a second. <laughs> <laughs> okay, actually, a lot of, oh, it's gone now. <laughs> um, because it's always good to know how the next generation benefits, and I was very gratified to see that block on your last slide with all of these uh, training events that had taken place. Are there any legacies from these training events that are still accessible? Well, uh, one thing that is happening in a couple of weeks is the dissemination event, which happens at the D Geological Society of London. It will be on November the 4th. Everybody is invited. The focus will be on uh, geothermal energy. The master's program that is listed over there, uh, that is attracting a very large amount of interest. We have, we have had 160 applications this past year. We can only offer about 40 places. So mm. that will stay uh, for the foreseeable future. Okay. Uh, for the early career scientists, uh, we are organizing a workshop in January where we are uh, trying to provide them support for finding jobs and move on in their careers. Okay. So the answer is yes. Thank you very much. Thank you.